So, uh, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Joel Forcu. I'm coming from the uh, uh, University of Paris uh, in France. Um, and I will speak about um, CMD programming today. But first, as a public service announcement, I just want to say that Yanni Gavaliu Paluski. So I will probably stick to English for everybody's sanity. Okay. So um, this talk will be about some kind of parallel programming and how it, uh, it could have been, you know, uh, wrapped and abstracted into modern C++. So usually, with this kind of talk, I always have this this issue about who know what about the topic. So the first question I will probably ask you is, who know what CMD programming is? Yeah, so that's probably 12 people or something, okay? So and among those guys and, and girls that probably knows what it is, how many of you actually try to use it in an actual production uh, you know, setup? Okay, that's three. And among you three, how many of you cried doing it? No, yeah, that's, well, that's probably because you're Russian. So basically what I will present today, uh, which is called Boost CMD, it's basically CMD programming but without the tears, okay? So, well, that's some challenge into this kind of, you know, um, handling of, of these parallel programming items. Um, so, as I say, I work in the uh, University of Paris University. I'm actually researching on parallel programming. So this is a mandatory slide I have to put every time, you know. So, yeah, parallelism is everywhere. That's probably the most obvious statement I could make today. Uh, you have the actual obvious parallelisms like the multi-core systems, many processors, the, mi the many cores, accelerators, distributed system of all shape and kind. And you have another kind of parallelism which is actually there from far, far before, which is more, let's say, um, shy. You have all the internal uh, instruction level and the world level parallelism inside the, uh, inside the CPU. Uh, multiple pipelines, uh, super scalar execution, out of order systems, and SIMD instruction sets, uh, which are something quite ancient, uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of the first uh, internal SIMD systems dates back from 1993 on some HP machines. And the notion of CMD computing is even more older because the good old vector machine from the, uh, the late 80s was basically based on, on the same premises. So the f question is, what's CMD? Well, if you have a regular processor with a regular um, arithmetic computing unit, what you do all day long is getting some instruction in at some clock rates, getting some data in, and your computing unit just takes the instruction, apply it to the data, and it probably try to give you a result somehow. So every clock rate, you get a new instruction in, it gets decoded, it gets pipeline, whatever, and then you get the results. So you probably have an output of one value as an output per clock rate. And in the very, very, you know, uh, important race about getting more out of our silicone stuff, people looked at for uh, ways to get more uh, out of that with a, re a similar amount of complexity. So one way to do this is to actually doing what we call CMD, which is a shorthand for single instruction, multiple data, which basically does what's, what's written on the can. You get every clock rate and instruction into your CMD instruction unit, but instead of, I get, of getting one data, you get a bunch of them, uh, usually a power of two, okay, between two and uh, 32 or 64, and at the same clock rate, you get this much output instead of one. So this is usually done by having a special set of registers inside your CPU, which is usually called wide registers, that can range from 64 on the old CMD machine to 512 bits now uh, in the upcoming KNL Intel systems or uh, um, also known as AVX512, which means that basically, uh, let's say that you got floating point, single precision floating point numbers coming in. In the same time, you can process one, 
there, you can process four, eight, or 16 of them at the same time. But the issue is you have to do the exact same computation on all of them. Okay? So normally, if everything goes right, these boxes should be like n times faster, n being the, the width of the vectors than the other one. And usually those units are a bit more than that because they usually have their own pipelines that could be run at the same time as a regular instruction set and so on and so on. So you get a massive amount of fairism over there. But the problem is all this power, um, I mean, you can get a free speed up of 2 up to 16 or something if you do it right, uh, which basically amounts to if you take it the other way around, not having to scale your, your production system by two, four, or eight more, uh, it's usually, you know, uh, it's usually underused for a lot of reasons. We will go over that. Um, but when it works, and actually we, we, can, we can show that it actually works in a lot of situations, uh, this is something which is actually uh, adapts with other sources of parallelisms. So you can get far more bucks for, for, for far more banks for your bucks uh, with the same CPU than before. So another part of the problem is, yeah, this is what we got right now. I try to sort that into you know big uh, processor family, but if we just look at Intel flavor of seeing the instruction set, we have like I don't know how many actually, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, or this is AMD, uh, 30 and 13, 14 if we count the new 500 something bits. So we have close to 16 different flavors of CMD just for Intel. We get a bunch less on PowerPC, but still a, a fair amount. And then we get a bunch of them on ARM. And there is a lot of even more exotic CPUs, embedded systems and so on, where you also got those special kind of um, SIMD instruction set. So the question is, if you if you want to write something, and you want to this code to benefit from SIMD instruction sets acceleration, and you want this piece of code to be somehow portable on different CPU family, welcome to L. Okay, and uh, it's I mean that's one of the parts people usually you know you can find a lot of people in the wild that dealt one or twice with SSC2 or maybe AVX. Got a lot of bunch of guys working with Altivec because that was one of the best uh, SIMD instruction set. And people dealing with ARM systems are usually, uh, you know, familiar with Neon and all these in 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 idioms. But if you really want to go everywhere, that's quite a piece of work. So, and it doesn't get better. So let's write a simple SIMD code the old way using intrinsics, which is actually C style function slash macro provided by the compiler to actually let you access those special instruction set and those special registers. Let's start with an easy one. I just want to write a function that takes two uh, 30 bits integer and give me the results. And I write that for Neon. So Neon has two flavor of white registers, 64 and 128 bits once. Oh, it's actually okay. You, you do a vector multiplication of sine 32 bit integer. And uh, if you want the 128 bit version, you just have to uh, use a Q there. We can manage that. We could actually s probably pass that into some kind of VMUL macro that get changed depending on how many bits you want. Okay. And then you go to SSC4. Well, it's pretty much the same, except the naming scheme is uh, what it is. <laughs> but it's a multimedia multiplication of the low part of uh, in packet integer of 32 bits. So the low part basically says that they probably do a full multiplication and give you the lower 32 bits. So that's OK. Still, again, you can probably fit that into the same macro than before. And then your boss came and said, yeah, you know what we need to supports those old SSC2 machines. So you glance over the intrinsic for SSC2 looking for this function, and you find none. But you find a lot of stuff you could actually use to reproduce this operation, and you end up with this very trivial code. 
OK, so free cake for anybody that actually understands what's going on there. Basically, you know, when you are in, uh, in school, you learn to, you know, put down your multiplication, put to your units and your, and your you know, uh, all your numbers one after the other, and you learn how to do the, comput the computation of the multiplication piecewise, doing the sum and whatever. So that's basically what we do, except we do it in base 128. So it's a bit more complicated, okay? Um, I think we failed like 10 times before in something that works correctly every time, but well, whatever. And then you switch to Altivec. Not actually better. Uh, it's the same story, you know, you, you take part of your, of your values, you shift them, you compute pieces of the product, and you put everything together. That's the exact same algorithm. Looks completely different. So if you, I don't think you really want to have macros wrapping all of this, okay? Uh, but this is basically what most people did for a long time. And uh, that's just multiplication. You know, if you really want to have a deck, you can try to write a vector version of integer divisions. And uh, after spending uh, hundreds of dollars in, you know, what's that name of that, you know, uh, uh, ADEC meetings, you probably say, screw you, I'm not doing this. So it's, it's a lot of variant, it's complicated sometimes, for, even for simple tasks, because the instruction set is very, very, very uh, widely changing across a family of CPU and even inside a given CPU. Operation may be incomplete, work, doesn't work on all the types, or it doesn't have all the operation, or even worse, the operation is there, but it doesn't give you the full precision. So if you want to have something which is actually manageable to use, it's a bit, it's a bit of a huge piece of work. But in fact, the question, isn't this just a compiler job? I mean, I'm writing code, and this compiler of mine should be sufficiently advanced to know that it can and should be using this very specific CPU instruction set. And it does. And auto vectorization is actually currently at a very nice place. It vector auto vectorizes a lot of complex code, as long as it just deals with uh, floating point numbers. Uh, you still have to have a lot of memory constraints. Uh, GCC is doing a great job at actually working on um, runtime sized uh, array by generating a, a prologue and an epilogue that handles the non vectorizable part and so on. Uh, but most of the time, the issue is that you should, if you don't see yourself that the code is probably written in a vectorizable way, well, the compiler probably won't, except in some cases. And you have also all the issues about library function. What if you use something like stdcos or, I don't know, uh, something like a special function from libc, and you're stuck with a compiler whose vendor didn't vectorize this one? Well, you don't get anything. And uh, sometimes compiler just get confused because you write the code slightly differently than it was looking for, and you just say, okay, I, I can't find anything interesting there. I'm not vectorizing anything. A funny bug that was fixed ages ago uh, was someone actually having a, a, a nicely layout array of double, of static size, perfect power of two, and you do something like A of i equals B of i times three, and you get vectorized. And later down in the code, you do something very similar, like a of i equals c of i times 5. And this one didn't get vectorized. So a lot of edge scratching happens. And he found out that the first code was actually a of i equals b of i times 3 point. So the constant was a double. So the compiler was happy because everything was a double. And the other one was times 5 without the dot, which was basically an integer. And the compiler said, I don't know how to vectorize doubles times integer. I'm doing nothing. Obviously, it should get vectorized because you can decide to just, you know, uplift the constant. So, well, so our approach is that we still need explicit SIMD um, uh, expression somewhere into the language. And what we try to do is trying to find a way to write a tool that lets you write SIMD code in a very explicit way, yet following a very nice subset of C++ items. And whenever these things compile, you know you get some speed up. So what we did was designing a library, but we designed a library uh, as an, a domain-specific embedded language, which is basically a declarative language 
embedded inside a generic language as a library or as another kind of systems, in which we abstract these wide registers as data block, a bit similar to STD array somehow. And uh, what we do is that we have a way to actually grab arbitrary expressions and see if we can find a pattern which is better than just doing what you want to write because your specific architectures has these very specific intrinsics. So the first goal was to make this CMD code generic enough so you can actually write a code once, don't care about the architecture, just change the compiler and the options and you get whatever else you want across hardware. But we wanted to also be integrable with the standard library, which means algorithms, iterators, stuff like this. And we wanted to get some actual meaningful more than C++ into this. So all this rambling uh, gave birth to what we call Boost CMD, which is still a candidate for inclusion into Boost. Well, it should be submitted quite soon. So what, what's the What's the, the main entry point? So Boost CMD gives you uh, a new type, which is called PAC, uh, because obviously vector is already taken. Okay. Um, so PAC has two parameters. First parameter is the type of the value you want to have in your wide register, quite um, obviously. And the second one is the number of elements in your wide register. But you can choose to just have a pack of T, and the library will just pick for you the optimal N value that ensures that on the current hardware, your types will be fitted into a CMD register. So most of the time what you want to write is write code using pack of T, so you get the maximum amount of flexibility over the hardware. And basically this pack of T or pack of T and behaves like a value of type T, except every operation applied to it is applied to all its components. There is some constraints, so T must be a fundamental type. I should have put that up to date, or uh, something which has a tuple-like um, semantic. N must be a power of two, because that's how it goes. And you have to use a special types if you want to have pack of Boolean value, which is logical of T. So logical of T is basically a Boolean, and the small change is, is that it's a Boolean that actually comes from some Boolean operation dealing with types T at the beginning. We need that because we need to, we saw that a bit later, we have a way in CMD programming to actually turn if-else into computation, so branchless computation, using mask, and obviously the mask must have the same amount of elements as whatever you are masking, so we need to know where the Boolean comes from, so hence this logical of T. So you have this pack, well, so what can you do with this? Well basically you have all the basic language operators, between packs of same types or packs and scalar of same types. And remember that it says that everything works like the operators uh, on T, I lied. There is one very fundamental difference is that we don't do neither conversion nor integer promotion. That means if you have 255 in the pack of U int 8 and you add one, you end up with zeros and not with an integer value of 256. The typing of this is very strict. Everything that has a T inside as an input must return a T unless something happens in the middle explicitly. We support comparisons, as I say, so every comparison operator performs an actual CMD parallel comparison. So you end up with a vector of yes or no, okay, for each element. So if you do a pack of A and B and you do A equal equal A, you end up with a pack of logicals that for every element says yes or no, does this element in A and B is equal. And we have functions like compare equal and compare less that return a single Boolean by ensuring that every, all, uh, all elements are equal into two vectors or performing a lexicographical comparisons. Uh, PAC is also both a random access range, so you have begin, end, size, and, and brackets if you want to access to the uh, internal value of the registers, and you can also access that as a fusion sequence, so you can statically iterate over the element of a pack. So we say that the pack of TN is equivalent to uh, a fusion tuple or a STD tuple actually of an element of type T, which enables us to actually do quite a few cool things internally. Okay, so we have that. The other very, very important thing in CMD is the way you handle memory. First, you have to know that if you want to get any benefit from CMD programming, 
A very, very important point is that your data must fit into the cache. If not, you're wasting your time. And once you set that up properly, you have two ways to load data from the memory inside a wide registers. Either using the align load and store function or the unaligned one. For a long time, CMD register must have been loaded from aligned memory. This is something which is relaxed right now, but we support both. And usually this unaligned load and store is obviously slower than the line one. So basically, if you call a line load, which is a bit verbal, so you, you, want, you have a pointer, which is usually a pointer of T, and some optional offset, and you want to load from this offset a pack of TN. So this will assert that P plus I is actually aligned on whatever the alignment constraint of the register is, and it will give you a pack with this piece of code inside. But sometimes, for example, when you deal with stencil-based operation, what you really, really want is this vector, and you know, you really want to have this one, actually, and probably this one, so you can implement some kind of sliding window operations. But this point, this address and this address are not aligned. So either you load them unaligned, and then performance decrease, or you can use what we call statically known misalignment, so you can add a static offset there. It says that basically P plus I minus offset is aligned. Okay. And it will perform an outward dependent way of loading these slided vectors uh, from the memory with as little uh, penalty as possible. On some systems, actually, you don't care. So that's just fall down back to calling the unaligned load. On modern hardware, your code also have conditional loading, so you can load pieces of memory in a conditional way where you have a, a vector of booleans telling you when and where you want to load, actually. And you could also have sparse access, on, uh, pro most, most, uh, most recently on the, on the Xeon Phi, where instead of having an integer as, um, as an offset, you could have a vector of integers, and the hardware would just pick up value from everywhere. So of course, this line load, well, actually this one, is uh, either you call it like this, or you could actually just call the pack constructor with the pointers, and it just does the correct thing from you, for you. We'll go over why we needed this function later. And a line store works the same way, but storing back the value from the register back to the memory. Another very, very important um, idioms in CMU programming is the fact that you, could, you can start with a scalar code, which has a very complex memory access patterns. And when you look at it, you know, while squinting your eyes, it happens that you could actually rewrite it by loading regular pieces of data from the memory and shuffling the data between the vector. And that's a, that, that has a tremendous effect because this shuffling operation is done by the vector LU and not by the memory elements. So you basically turn memory access with a complex pattern and probably issue with the cache into computation, raising your computation density, which is actually cool. So you can do something like this. So let's say you want to generate this vector of float containing one, two, three, four. Uh, you have the enumerate function for doing this. So you take a seed and it just add one after the others. And you say that B is equal to 10, 11, 12, 13, same things. But what you really want to have for some reason is 4, 12, 0, 10, whatever. So you have this shuffle function that takes one or two vectors, and you can actually pass a template list of index. And uh, well, what it does is rather logical, so it will fetch the third element. So what it does is you, you look at a, a and B as if they were concatenated, so the third element is 0, 1, 2, uh, 3, so that's 4. Then the sixth one is um, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that's 12. The fourth one is uh, 10. And the minus one is something that SEC introduced and a lot of other SIMD hardware support is that if it's not something which is inside the range between zero and twice the size of the vector, you just put a zero. So you can actually shuffle uh, complex patterns. And internally, the library is able to look at this pattern and decide, oh, it should be done on the hardware by min minimizing the number of computation. But the problem with this interface is that you have to know how many elements you have in your vectors. 
And it goes against the fact that you may want to have a pack of tea without any size. Good news, everyone. You could actually write a meter function that will compute the static integer using this interface. So basically, this structure contains an apply internal structure that takes two integral constant, the index you want to re-index, and the number of elements into, um, into the vector. And so you can say, for example, uh, whenever you ask what you should put in position i, I want you to put c minus i minus 1, which is basically reversing the vector. And you can just pass the structure to shuffle, and you don't have to care about the number of index. Uh, currently, we are looking to see how we can turn all this mess into a, a nice context per function based uh, interface. But that basically is the gist of it. So either you can actually enumerate whatever your permutation is, or you can just write a generic permutation. So that's the basics. Now we wanted to, as I say, we wanted to be integrated with the STL. So we provide a SIMD version of fold and transforms, uh, which use polymorphic functor or polymorphic lambdas uh, as a way to handle uh, the potential scalar and SIMD uh, difference between these elements. That's something we put it back uh, in the old days. That probably gets shifted out uh, if the executor's proposal uh, give us good amount of performance when using SIMD mode, but for now they are there. And we have a bunch of iterators that encapsulate a uh, strategic uh, way of work through, working through the data in the SIMD mode. So you could actually take a, an arbitrary random access or even contiguous iterator and turn it into an align or an unalign input or output SIMD iterator. You have a direct output iterator that just say, instead of storing it back into the memory using the cache, just trimming back to memory so you don't pollute the cache back. And we have the shifted iterator that lets you work over your data using a sliding window. And all of these are obviously intercompatible. So let's say you have a vector of float and you want to multiply every element by two, and whenever possible you want to vectorize this operation, you can write something like this. Uh, so you can make a vector. Uh, oh yeah, we have a, a SIMD allocator that's just a line memory. Uh, this is getting phased out into a boost alignment. So we don't provide it anymore, but the slide is like this. And you have some amount of element inside, which may or may not be a multiple of the register size, okay? So what you can do is just, okay, I want to do this, multiply everybody by two and vectorize whenever possible. So you can call a SIMD transform between the beginning and end of V, and what you do is you pass this uh, polymorphic lambda that takes something and just say, okay, multiply these things by two. So why does it have to be polymorphic? What happens is that this SIMD transform will generate a prologue and an epilogue because it doesn't know yet how many elements you have and if those memories actually align. So we take care of the epilogue and the prologue in scalar mode. So every function provided by boost SIMD also work on scalar values. And whatever is in the middle gets vectorized. So by having this polymorphic function there, this multiplication is actually whatever operators on scalar or pack, and it gets it's transparent for the users. A more complicated example is actually uh, let's make um, a sliding window of size three uh, average over some data. So then again, you can get your vector, and it gets a bit more complex. So we can actually also use STD transform. Uh, when you know statically that this address, uh, that memory is already allocated. So what you want to do is uh, walk over in uh, using your sliding window size tree, and you want to store the output uh, into O, and you call average. Well, I could have put a macro, but well. So what does this uh, macro, sorry, a lambda, what I'm saying. So what happens? This iterator actually feeds the transform function functor there, uh, with a value which is actually behave like an array, which is statically sized to the sliding window size, okay? And so you can just take whatever element into your sliding window and do whatever you want, okay? And uh, the system is made so the advancement into the sliding window is done in the proper way depending on the hardware, either using unaligned load when it's not costly or using the statically known misalignment items. And so you do your whatever um, average there, and it gets, stored, uh, it gets stored into the output in a vector way. 
So yeah, so we have a value type on T because that's basically an STD array and, uh, and done. So you just have to, okay, I get whatever these things give me, I know how many I have, and I do whatever I want with my, with my sliding window. Something we wanted to do also was to, to be able to uh, handle a lot of very specific hardware SIMD instruction. A lot of, for example, a lot of SIMD instruction sets as what they call fused operation, the most well known being FMA, <coughs> so that you can in one cycle do A plus B times C instead of doing it in two pieces. But we wanted those kind of optimization to stay transparent for the users because you may or may not know if your system has an FMA. So what we do is we use expression templates uh, so we can actually capture the arbitrary uh, expression and look at them before compiling the code and uh, whenever we find something that looks like an FMA in one way or the other, we just replace this piece of expression with the correct call. Uh, we do the same for another bunch of uh, interesting pattern like this one which is uh, usually um, optimized on some hardware uh, and so on and so on. So you don't have to care to know about does my hardware have special fused instruction, we, we would take care of that for you. So we support a bunch of stuff. Well, this is also outdated, come on. So uh, the open source version, which is actually available, uh, goes up to uh, all, all Intel variants and PowerPC. Uh, we are currently moving this piece of Intel back there, and we have some proprietary extension for let's say more exotic architectures, uh, including the mic, Neon, and some other very uh, specific ones. Uh, and the plan is to migrate this, you know, as time goes. Okay, and we have a lot of other functions. Actually, we have, I think, 350 something functions, uh, in addition to all the operators. So we support saturated arithmetics, long multiplication, conversions, every uh, floating point based operation rounding uh, square roots, whatever. Uh, you, we also have rounded divisions and reminder with um, uh, optional way of rounding. Uh, we have a lot of bitwise operation because that's one of the uh, cool tricks you can do with SIMD that a lot of algorithm can be turned down into bit tricks and it goes right real fast. So we have select which is basically selecting value depending on the mask, all combination of n or not in every shape pop count, first bit set, rotation, and so on and so on. We have a lot of IIII specialized function, uh, predicates, uh, including IIII predicates like is invalid and stuff like this. And we have more specific SIMD operation like reduction, so you have a vector, you have, you have a pack, and you want to have an information that's basically squeeze the pack into a single value like uh, uh, the sum of the elements, the products, the minimum, stuff like this. And as I say, with Shuffle, we have what we call inter-register operation. So you get a register in and you get a register out, but what you did was basically shuffling or building some new vectors with the old one. You could actually, for example, um, merge two vectors of a given size to get a bigger one, uh, either with the same base type or with the smaller types. You can slice them. Um, something that came um, a lot is what we call splatted reductions. So you want to do something like V1 equal V2 times the sum of V3. And it's a bit stupid to compute the sum as a scalar, just to put the scalar back into a vector. So you can just call splatted sum, that basically do the sum, but keeps the result of the sum everywhere in the vector. Cumulative operation, and we can also uh, apply sorting on the element of a vector. So yeah, that's more than 300 and something functions uh, that works on all those hardwares. So now, let's speak about performances, okay? Because that's probably why we, we wanted to do all of this. So I will go through different uh, examples. So first stuff we did was trying to re-implement simple uh, trigonometric functions. First as an exercise in expressivity and then as something we put into the library afterwards. So this, those results are made on an AVX machine, single precision value for every function. Every value are randomly uh, drawn between this range. And we compare three things. We compare the speed of the standard implementation, okay? The speed of our own uh, scalar implementation, which is basically a scalar version of the SIMD versions, and the actual SIMD code. 
And what we do is we compute the amount of cycles you spend in the CPU to generate one result, one scalar result. So obviously, uh, if you look at this, when I say seven, it's seven cycles per value. So on AVX, you have eight floating points into a register. So seven times eight is, I never remember, 50 something, no. How many, well, whatever. So it's 50 some things, but for eight value at a time, okay? So we just normalize uh, everything this way. So why is the range now? Um, those functions are very sensitive in the way we want them to be uh, fast and or precise. So what we decided to do in BlueCMD is to try to get the most amount of precision all the time. So that's basically the range which is known for those function to be, to have a meaningful precision. Uh, in all the cases, even if you go out there, we, we are still outperforming the standards, and in the worst case, we are as slow or as fast as the scalar version times the number of value. So uh, we got pretty interesting results, so we... Oh, I'm very late then. Uh, <laughs> we got something which are basically sub-10 cycles for x -pen log. Uh, we have pretty fast trigonometrics too. Uh, we basically go... 10 times faster than uh, STD. And uh, we try to, to do something funny. So how do you actually compute cosinus in CMD? So either you have the chance to have a hardware that gives you a roughly adequate approximation of the cosinus and the sinus, and you try to get back the missing bits, or you don't. And then you have to go back to uh, having a funky polynomial interpolation of the cosinus. And we find out that there is basically thousands of ways to do this, poly this polynomial evaluations. Uh, some are far better than others. And the one we picked up has a very funny property that you could actually slice it, you know, you can stop the polynomial whenever you want, and you basically get the same precision than before, but on a restricted range. So for example, if you want to do a cosinus between p over 4 and minus p over 4, which happens to be the angle range some sensors give you, what you can call fast cost, and uh, yeah, we, we got that low. We got basically uh, 10 cycles for computing 8 cosinus. Another example, again, that's a very simple one. We generate this very well-known fractal image. Uh, the cool thing with this uh, fractal stuff is that the workload depends on the pixel location, so we have to be smart on how we want to handle that, and it's purely compute-bound. So we expect to have a perfect speed-up. So the code is actually quite easy to write. So that's basic function, uh, that's basic um, implementation of the functions. So, and the funny thing is that you can actually write it in a generic way. So this function, you can call it with a scalar or a vector. Uh, what do you get? You get floating point, you get uh, floating point numbers um, as an input, which are the, the point you are computing on. And what you do is you return a value, which is the, uh, an integer of the same size of t. So we have this meta function that turn that into the proper integer. So, and so we have the classical do y loop that you get into this kind of algorithm. So we compute x square, y square, blah, 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 square. Do the operation. And uh, I'm missing a line. OK, whatever. Uh, what we do is we want to know, oh yeah, this is, this is mask, OK? So mask is, um, if this is true, OK? I'm incrementing my, uh, my iter variables, and if not, I just let it this way for every element. And I stop whenever, and I continue doing this, so, sorry, as long as I didn't hit the maximum amount of iteration I'm allowed to do, and any of the iter value is, uh, is still zero. Okay, so whenever some, when, when this becomes false, that means that everybody converged, and we can just go back. So this is the kind of speed up we can get. I don't know if we can actually see. So yeah, so the green bars over there are uh, the scalar version of the code written in C by end and compiled with whatever auto vectorization optimization on the compiler to have a fair comparison. So we end up with something around 600 something cycles per pixels. And the boost CMD versions using SSC2 for the purple one and uh, AVX, AVX2 for the others, yeah. 
Uh, so we get the speed up of, so that's floating point number, so we expect to have a speed up of four and a speed up of eight on ABX. And we have something close to three there and something close to seven over there, uh, which is pretty much stable with the size of the images. And of course, when you switch to this to that, the only thing you have to do is don't touch your code, you just change the compiler options to generate AVX code. A more complex example is motion detection algorithms, which is based on uh, the um, so-called sigma delta algorithms, uh, which basically evaluate motion between video frames by doing background subtraction, which is a classical way to do it, but instead to have a global thresholding on is it a movement or not, it uses a modelization that every pixel intensity is actually a Gaussian, and whenever your value of the pixels varies more than the Gaussian's you know, uh, standard deviation, that means that you are something that moves. It sounds complicated, but the funny thing is that the algorithm can be written with a couple of if and plus plus and minus minus or on three or four integers. That's actually very interesting. But we end up with an algorithm which has a very, very low arithmetic intensity and that use um, low uh, dynamic uh, integers like eight bit integers for the image. So the code is not that big either. So the sigma delta algorithm takes the background, the current frame and the variance of the images and what you do basically is, depending on if your background is ordered with the current pixel in the frame, you increment or decrement the background. And then you compute the distance with this updated background with the current frame. You multiply it by three, because three sigma, okay? And whenever your variance is below or over this three sigma stuff, you increment or decrement it. And you know that something moves if the variance is actually um, lower, uh, the computed vi updated variance is lower than the, uh, the three sigma you compute, the difference, sorry, you compute it. So a lot of new things. So we, we got this cell in cell deck, which is basically conditional increment and decrement. Uh, we have those operators. We have dist, which is basically an optimized uh, value, uh, absolute value of the difference of the pixels. Uh, mule s, which is saturated multiplication. If else, which basically replace if else, okay, by doing computation, comparison to constant, blah, blah, blah. And we have those shortcut function. So if zero else one basically means that if these things is true, I get a zero, and if not, I get a one. And it gets optimized because you can do bit tricks with the actual mask there to get this value directly. So sometimes it's, it's interesting to use that. And what, what do we get as a performance? So that's frame per seconds, that 10,000 frames per second, actually. Um, so we have, a, the scalar version is not that bad. We are around uh, 1.5 thousand um, um, frame per seconds. And so we got a speed up of, oh my god, uh, 3.8 in SSC2, uh, which is not that bad. Uh, we go up to six something in ABX. Uh, mostly because some operations are available which are not available in SSC2. And AVX2 has a good idea to have a 32 car wide register for 8 bit integers. So we just climb up to 26. And we go down as the, uh, the image and the number of live reference into the cache increase with the size of the images. But we can go up to 20, 526 out of times 22, which, uh, 32, which is not that bad. Last stuff, uh, I don't have any code there for some reasons. Uh, we want to solve a three diagonal system uh, which is represented as a sparse matrix. So we have a matrix composed of three diagonals, the main one and the upper one and the lower one. This matrix is fixed and we have a lot of right hand side members we want to solve for. And uh, so we apply these algorithms that basically do some funky computation on the fact that the we know that it's a three diagonal function. Um, this code has been written in Fortran initially and get, some, and get some performances and we wanted to see if we can do better. And so what we did was basically actually uh, vectorizing along the uh, right hand side members. So whenever you have two, four, eight uh, right hand side into your uh, linear solving algorithm, we were vectorizing over there. And the trick was to actually use a shuffle to blindly load data from the sparse matrix without 
taking care about the structures and shuffling them so we end up with a very small local dense matrices that was exactly the representation of this part of the pieces of the matrix we need. Solve this local system using this formula, basically removing these uh, dependencies from across the vector. So one use of shuffle. So this is a, the speed up we got. So the red, orange, whatever, curve there, uh, it's a Fortran code. So it, again, in, it's, it's in cycle per value as our output, uh, based on the number of systems solved as a second member. So we go from 28 up to 80 something cycles per value. And the boosting versions compiled in C++ is a blue one, which is basically flat, averaging at 27. And this is done because, yeah, we, we trade this very complex memory access to blindly regular memory access plus shuffles. Something that the Fortran compiler apparently doesn't know how to do automatically. So we end up with a speed up of three or something uh, for very large, um, very large uh, systems. So the cool thing with this metric is that if you look at it, you see that it jumps, okay, this way. And every time you see a jump in this kind of curve, that basically means you, you hit a cache limit. So basically, the Fortran version is limited by the cache, and we are not. So as a conclusion, so uh, we found out that you could actually write a library that take care of this kind of low-level CMD operation, and we can design it so it's generic enough, so it makes sense to be usable uh, into a generic C++ modern style code. Uh, we try very hard to have a very complete subset of functions and functionalities. Uh, it's quite hard, uh, especially when you, when you do the, cr the computation of all the different versions. Uh, we apply that in different scenarios, so some in research, some in, in, into the industry, um, in different uh, systems like uh, video compressions, um, audio processing, and whatnot. Um, we are currently living there uh, as a sub-project of the NT2 project. We are currently moving to a new location. Uh, when the uh, current rewrite and extraction for boost submission will be complete, probably by uh, mid-March or something. And uh, once, this is, once this is done, well, off we go, submission to boost. That's far too long, we, we should have been doing that. And we are looking at actually uh, well, getting more function, but that's, that's a trivial part, but also looking at more architectures, uh, we really want to be able to target whatever as a CMD instruction set and support a decently recent C++ compilers. Uh, so you can, if you really want, you can grab this, test, make comments, uh, tell us what works, what doesn't work. Uh, we are very eager to get, uh, to get back new use cases and new application cases. So thanks for your attention. If you have any questions. Does your library support some kind of uh, storing or uh, restoring uh, registers? Uh, currently, we don't do anything special. Uh, we know it exists. Uh, but currently, what happens is that what, whatever the code we generate, the compiler looks like he knows what he does. Uh, that's something we may put in at some point. Uh, but it's more a problem of where it should fit into the API. Uh, but yes, that's something we are aware of. Currently, we never had any issue with it, but we know that we need to be careful of that. So that's probably something that will be put back afterwards, yes. Uh, yes, because uh, operating system takes care of this. But uh, if you write code without operating system, and if you want to try this, um, um, this, uh, these instructions, you should yeah. properly initialize and deinitialize it. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. that's the use case we are aware of, yeah. That's okay. probably something we need to put back. I mean, uh, in, in a completely different cases, but in s yet similar, we, we got people that want us to support MMX. And MMX has this bad idea to require you to, you know, set up the stack in some way. Uh, 
and you cannot just do it for every function because if not, you get no performances. So it's a bit similar. So we need to find a way to tell people, okay, you can put this there. Current, current ideas is basically probably having some kind of, you know, of error to I uh, enabled system that say, okay, um, start up, you know, vector savings or whatever into a scope and, and clean it up afterwards. That, but the main issue is what should be the, uh, the proper interface. But yeah, we, we are looking into that. Uh, also, I have one question. Uh, when you show uh, uh, pack, yes, uh, I, I, uh, as I understand, you can uh, uh, put uh, your pack uh, on, the st on the stack, yes? Yes. Uh, and uh, you um, suppose that the stack is properly aligned for yep. also operating system should, uh, should, be, should yeah. do what for you. What we do is that we, we, we have an internal macro that forces the alignment of the, stru of the structure. Uh, the main issue we have with that is that if you have your own types that contain members which are packed, you need to propagate this macro. Uh, and for function calls, what we found out is that if you really, really want to be uh, able to dodge this issue, uh, your function must take pack as, as a reference, or you must force in line the function so you never go on the stack. So we, we have a small array of uh, I would say that band aids that help people that actually get into these exact very particular problems to solve it. Okay, thank you.